All right, you slip into the warehouse undetected. Below you, three zombies stand guard in front of Prince Kamiyoshi. Okay, I drop down on them and attack. You easily dispatch the three. Shazam! Is the prince okay? He is, but he seems overwhelmed by what just happened. Wait, can I just say that I'm having a really good time? Yeah? I was skeptical when you said you wanted to run an Oriental Adventures module based on anime, but I'm enjoying using Kung Fu to take down ninjas. The mecha suits took some getting used to, but, you know, I even like whatever this cutesy turd thing following me around is. Gooby-doo! Gooby-doo! Well, there's still one more aspect of anime we haven't covered. Is that what that big tentacle monster is for? <laughs> Dave? <laughs> Dave? <laughs> Hi there. Sidra and I were just painting an entire culture of animation with a broad, unflattering brush. The truth is, I love aberrations. Of all the families of D&D monsters, only aberrations are truly unique to D&D. Unlike the rest of the monsters in D&D, which come from mythology or fantasy literature, aberrations were hatched in the minds of Midwestern nerds in the 70s, which makes them the most horrific of all. This week, I'm making a roper and uh, setting the bar for this project extra low, as even professional roper miniatures are kind of goofy. Let's face it, this monster is half angry cyclops and half turd. The head of our roper is a pine cone, uh, to which we will affix a plastic jewel for an eye. I went with a round one. It's a little more eye-like. The jewel works because it's faceted, as is every aspect of this roper going to be. We're also going to chop up a plastic lizard from Nature World. It's, uh, we're going to use his feet, his front legs, feet, uh, for his mouth, for the roper's mouth, and bits of the body are going to form bits of our roper body. We just have to arrange them in the right way. Now, I'm not going to try to glue rubber to rubber, so I'm going to give this sort of a structure inside. I do that by gluing various wooden beads. I'm also going to wire them together. So, uh, don't want to try to glue rubber. It's just, it's horrible. So, unfortunately, that means I have to pin everything. Uh, we'll be using lizard tails for the tentacles, and I'm uh, pinning right now into the, um, I'm using parts of the lizard that have legs. Those are going to form sort of the shoulders. And uh, this is great because, you know, we get the nice spikes in the front, and we get the lizard belly in the back, and it just makes the roper look more organic, instead of me just cutting it out of cardboard or something. We get to uh, borrow from nature, which always has a much better aesthetic, I find. You find uh, some kind of rubber creepy crawly, you chop it up, and you get a better monster than, uh, at least better than me if I tried to sculpt it. You see I'm sticking this wooden bead here in the bottom, um, because that I'm going to glue to the pine cone, and then uh, I'm going to run a spike through the hole in the bead. Not a spike, I'm going to run a wire through the hole in the bead, and that's going to uh, hold this whole thing together, basically. Putting on plenty of hot glue on there. We're going to slam the pine cone down, which now has the mouth and the eye on it. We've got the two lizard tails uh, pinned and glued. Uh, one lizard um, tail came with this lizard. I also have uh, another smaller lizard model that's um, providing the other tentacle arm. <clears throat> We're going to use our Dremel tool on both the base of the lizard and to the shoulder area and then also into the individual lizard tails. And then we're going to put a nice heavy gauge wire into the shoulder and we're going to cut it with just a little bit hanging out with our nice wire cutters here. And then we're going to put the tail on top of that. If we look inside the body of our roper we can see that heavy gauge wire running through the bead which is glued to the pine cone on the top and it's wrapped around and it's holding the whole thing together. Now we're going to stick the top of this plastic bottle. This is a plastic bottle from Kroger, but any thin store brand bottle will work. In fact, we actually want a bottle that's thin so it will melt. That way when we apply the hot glue, the plastic will melt and it'll all wrap and it'll actually make a much stronger bond to the rubber body. And uh, that's gonna be the base of our roper. Now we're going to take it outside and prime it. I'm setting it up and what's nice is it's got a great big wide base so it can stand up and I can hit it from all sides with the black primer which is going to make it paint up that much faster. I'll have to uh, do this side then flip it and do that side. Uh, it should be a pretty quick job. 
Once that spray paint is dried, and you got a nice layer of flat black on there, we're gonna start dry brushing it gray, folks. I know if you've seen this show before, you'll realize this is a technique I use a lot. Um, just a lot of monsters are sort of colorless and slimy, especially in the underdark. It seems that way. And uh, yeah, we're just gonna dry brush it gray with um, lighter shades of gray as we get higher and higher up on the body where the light's hitting it. And uh, we're gonna do the same on the back here. And it's just gonna bring out the texture that much more. And uh, we're not truly dry brushing it in the sense where we're making sure the brush, brush is empty because we're covering large areas. And uh, the detail's pretty rough. There's really no need, and plus we have a lot of surface to cover. But um, you don't want the paint too wet. And uh, we're not trying to get into every crack. We really wanna show that texture. Now I'm applying a brick red, nice dark red to the eye. I'm gonna put the same thing on the mouth parts and I'm gonna steadily add white to that and eventually we'll um, have sort of a pinkish for the highlights. We're going to uh, use black to separate the eye from sort of the tissue above it and also to add a pupil. I've got a doubly thick cardboard base on here. Uh, as you can see, it's a, it's a heavy model and it's gonna get heavier once I apply a bunch of hot glue to the top of that pine cone. And I'm using my nice thinned out craft glue. And we're gonna dip this whole thing into green tea for flock. I'm gonna try to cover up as much of that clear, unpainted um, glue as possible, but the flock will take care of most of that. Now, uh, I wasn't entirely happy with this project when I was finished with it, so I decided I need a little detail on the base. I cut up this plastic starfish, it's uh, I think out of a 25 cent machine, or I may have just found it somewhere, and that's going to give us some stumpy tentacles along the foot, it's just an added detail. Those could be unformed uh, ropes, and I'm also going to fill in the pine cone with a bunch of hot glue, and uh, it just looked too pine cone-y to me. I, I couldn't get over it, you know. It, it, it's a competent looking figure, but it, it just kept screaming arts and crafts. There's just this pine cone head leering at me, mocking me. So I, I filled it with uh, hot glue, as you can see here, and uh, I used almost the whole stick. And I'm um, gonna have, I didn't really need to fill it in so much as have it drip along the sides, and the end product is going to have a lot of dripping hot glue coming out of the head. And the hot glue coming out of the top, we're going to paint that up in sort of blood as well, just to match the rest of the tissue that we have for the eye and the mouth. And lighter levels of red for highlighting. Let's take a look at the finished product. I am beautiful, no matter what they say. Words can't bring me down. Bring me down, the love, the 